This week on the Pro Wrestling Podcast, podcast. NXT gets the big deal with the CW. But what about the NWA? Is Vince McMahon being pushed out of TKO? Warner Brothers scraps a John Cena Wile E. Coyote movie. And AEW looks to be in some very serious trouble. I'm your host, Seth Grimes, and this is the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. What the fuck is up, everybody? Welcome on in to another episode of the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. I am your humble host, Seth Grimes, back in the chair again. Dust off the old microphone. Excited to be sitting here bringing you all the week's latest in pro wrestling podcast content shoot interview content was a bigger week this week a lot of shit going on it's been slow over the last couple weeks uh so i did put up some extra content or some halloween content in place of some pro wrestling podcast stuff so if you haven't had the chance to check out any of those videos yet i highly recommend it doing so i did one on the uh top 10 pro wrestling horror gimmicks for the halloween season and then i also did while i was doing that my own personal top 10 favorite horror movies so if you're into that kind of stuff and you want to take a sidebar outside the wrestling stuff after you're done watching this show Go ahead and check that out on my YouTube channel. And speaking of my YouTube channel, would you please hit that subscribe button? What the f are you doing? If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, why are you even? Why? I mean, no, I, I, please stay. I want you to stay. I mean, if you refuse to, to hit the subscribe button, I still want you to watch the show. Maybe I'll change your mind towards the end. But please help a brother out. Let's hit that monetization goal by the end of the year. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump on into our first topic here today. Well, the NXT brand is moving on up in the world as it was announced this week that NXT is going to be moving from the USA Network, who has picked up SmackDown now from Fox, uh, but has not yet renewed Raw, so that one is still up in the air. Uh, but the USA Network has let go of NXT. Uh, they've switched it up for SmackDown, and so the NXT show will now be moving over to the CW Network. And while that does not sound like a major network to some, the CW is network television, so it is able to... Uh, basically be picked up from an antenna. So you could just be out in the middle of the woods with your fucking tinfoil up in the air and you might be able to pick up a signal of whoever the fuck on NXT, Braun Breaker, smashing somebody in half. This is a big deal for the NXT brand. This is said to be a 70% increase from what they were making over at the USA Network. Uh, the exact numbers have not been released as of yet, but the deal is said to be somewhere between 20 and $25 million annually. So that's, uh, you know, roughly a $100 million deal over five years. It was a five-year deal that was signed. This is huge. Very, very big deal for the CW Network who does not get ratings in the amounts that pro wrestling can draw to it. It's top shows probably don't even really do a million or maybe do a million. So this is a big, big get for them. But you may be wondering, Seth, hold up a minute. I thought, I thought Billy Corgan just announced like a week ago that he, the NWA had signed a deal or, or had a TV deal to have two shows on the CW. 
the uh, power show and the reality show. Well, if you had heard that, you would be wrong. And this is, of course, the latest example of the pro wrestling Mandela effect, where you thought you knew something to be true, and in fact, it's not, and it never happened. So, shh. Of course, that's what uh, Billy Corgan might want you to think, but that's not exactly what happened. So what did happen? Could it be the irresponsible cocaine spot that everybody is throwing a fit about? You guys got a problem with a little bit of cocaine? Cocaine's fine. Everybody likes a little bit of cocaine, right? Cocaine's good. Cocaine's fine. You just take a little bit of cocaine. You get to get up. You get your day started. You get a lot of things done. A lot of things done is really, really good. Cocaine is a good drug. Ask Tony Khan. You guys being haters about it. But regardless, did it was it the cocaine deal that fucked this up for Billy Corgan and the NWA? Well, maybe, maybe not. As Mike Johnson sat down to sort all this out. Yes, I'm finally getting to the clip. Mike Johnson sat down with Eric Bischoff and John Alba over on the Strictly Business podcast this week to sort all of this out. As Mike Johnson is obviously a wrestling dirt sheet reporter, but he is also comes from the TV business. This is sort of his area of expertise. So uh, let's go ahead and check on in with this clip and see, uh, you know, Mike Johnson kind of break all this shit down for us. CW was talking to a number of different people in the wrestling industry. They, you know, obviously there's discussions. Oh, there's an NWA deal. No one from the CW end ever told me there was, but certainly on the NWA end, there were people whispering, oh, we've heard this, we've heard that. But I know they were talking to Dave Marquez Productions about potentially doing a live show every week out of Los Angeles, and it got to the point that they were come doing blueprints for sets and uh, strategies for our advertising and marketing and things like that. But then, you know, the giant ship that is WWE came looming in like Godzilla, and if you're CW, are you going to go with an upstart, or are you going to spend a little bit more and go with the industry leader and know that you've got a built in audience. And I think that's what happened here is that rather than going with something that they would have had to help build from ground up, they went with something that even although NXT amongst the wrestling fans is considered like the third tier brand to the outside world, it's still WWE. So right. there's a built in ad audience there, no sure. matter what, what brand it is. Um, so, so there's a lot of ground I want to cover there that you just hit on because I think there's a lot of layers. And I want to start with that NWA thing because when the CW deal was announced first with NXT the other day, or when you broke the news first, I should say, uh, immediately everyone was like, well, what happened to this NWA deal that had been reported? And there was the note that indicated that the cocaine segment that Billy Corgan had greenlit uh, might have affected that. What is your read on all that? Because right. that's what every wrestling fan is curious about. Okay, right so now. here's my read on that. You cannot tell me that a two-second spot on a pay-per-view that only aired on Fight.TV was going to be such a big deal, and so many people watched it on Fight that the entire universe wrote in horror like Alderaan had been blown up in Star Wars and went to CW Network and said, how could you put this on your TV when it was never on there, never going to be on their TV to begin with? I don't believe there's, I don't believe there's any bearing on that spot and the CW deal happening or not happening. What I believe happened is Billy Corgan and his crew were selling this. Uh, I heard it was a 12 episode reality series about Billy running the NWA. And I would assume other aspects of Billy's life. Now the WWE deal doesn't start until the fall of 2024. Right. The CW network could put a 12 week show on tomorrow and air it for a couple of months. And then it's done. So that, you know, it's still possible that show could air in some way, shape, or form on the CW network just before the WWE deal officially kicks in and they start paying WWE. Because in my sure. heart of hearts, I don't believe for a second WWE is letting any other wrestling on a network that they're currently on. So, Mike, I, I just want to make sure I understand. I was led to believe, not believe, but I was in, I read on social media that CW was considering an NWA wrestling series. And, oh, by the way, there's a reality series. What I'm hearing you say is there's a reality series, but there was no confirmation. And I've I never, I, now, I don't mean to cut you off. I've never heard anything from anyone in the broadcast industry that I speak to. And I speak to a lot of people in that world because that's the world. The entertainment world is what I worked in before I did this for a living. 
And I haven't heard from anybody on the CW network. And I've written some pretty high up people there that have come back to me and said, yeah, we're, we're in discussions with Corrigan. The show's definitely happening. This is what, this is 100% true. What I believe happened is I think they, they probably had, I'm saying probably, probably had conversations about the reality show. And in those conversations, it was like, oh, and we have a wrestling show too. And if you guys would like this, Maybe you could put it on your app. Maybe you. That would, you know, that would be. That that's would be, what my guess is. That would be natural. That yeah, makes sense, right? And that's it's, my guess. So, as stupid as the cocaine spot may have been when you're trying to lock down a TV deal with a major network like the CW, uh, you know, for me, my personal taste, I, I who cares? You know, I'm not. I don't get offended easy, so I'm not butt hurt over a cocaine spot. But I would say if you're in the middle of a TV deal, it is in poor taste. Rumors are now that the NWA locker room is pretty frustrated. I'm sure they were all very excited and kind of pumped to get the opportunity to be on TV, and they were all built up for this. And now they are led to believe that this opportunity was blown, possibly because it was their own boss, Billy Corgan, who wanted to. He insisted on the cocaine spot. But Mike Johnson here, he doesn't think it was the cocaine spot. And you know what? I kind of see where he's coming from. I'm with him on this one because one little cocaine spot ain't going to blow a full-fledged TV deal if they're like, Everybody's on board and it's all but signed. You know, the ink hasn't dried yet or whatever. It's not going to be that. But what it would be would be NXT. NXT, the WWE monolith, the major fucking entity that is the WWE. Nobody's going to be able to compete with that. Not even AEW could if Warner Brothers decided they wanted to be in the WWE business now. You know, they could pick up Raw and fucking... Tell AEW to go kick rocks. That's a possibility. I don't think it will because uh, I think the Raw deal doesn't that go start in 2024 and AEW is signed through 2024. So I don't think that'll end up being the case, but you get the point. Um, NXT came in and they just pushed everybody else out. Mike Johnson even said that there were other uh, pro wrestling from Hollywood was in talks with producing a show for the CW. And that makes me wonder even, look, Freddie Prince Jr., uh, what's he got going on? What kind of TV deal could he scoop up? Being a guy in Hollywood, he's got just as good of a chance at getting something off the ground as a Billy Corgan does at this point. And, and make no mistake, the NWA moniker isn't enough to carry the NWA. It's Billy Corgan's indie promotion. He's trying to get it on a national level, just like everybody else. But right now, it's a little indie fed. You know, when Freddie Prinze Jr. steps into the wrestling business, he could step in and be right there in competition with Billy Corgan. MLW's right there in competition with them. If pro wrestling from Hollywood was talking to the CW, they're obviously trying to get something going. Uh, OVW has their reality show on Netflix. That's raising OVW's stock huge. I mean, OVW had a name value because of their association with WWE back in the day. But now with Netflix, it's kind of popping back up again on the radar. So there's lots of competition out there. Billy Corgan is not above any of those others other than he is Billy Corgan. You know, and a Freddie Prince Jr. would be a good counter to that. Um, it, it was in poor taste, but it didn't cost them the deal. It was NXT moving in that cost them the deal. But regardless, it should have never been announced or even talked about if it wasn't signed and secured and it wasn't on the dotted line. Now, Mike Johnson, who says that he has talked to people within the CW now, that now take everything with a grain of salt, obviously, even me and my opinion here. But Mike Johnson had indicated that people in the CW had said that they were interested in the reality show, mostly because Billy had pitched it, having including his wedding. So it's essentially the a reality show of Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins, who happens to be doing this little side hobby of a wrestling show, with no mention of a side possible wrestling show to go along with it. 
uh, could have just been very much the same kind of thing that OVW has with Netflix. A behind-the-scenes show of, you know, this NWA thing going on. Uh, but, you know, Billy had uh, been very clear that they were going to pick up both shows, that power was going to be going there. It was set in stone. I can now say for the first time, and I have to be a bit vague because there's some other political aspects to this, but I can now say that we finally have signed not just one, but two television deals and that announcement as far as where and who uh, will be coming soon. But we finally now will be able to move off YouTube, not exclusively because we want to still do stuff on YouTube, but we now will be moving with a network partner. But if the lines were not signed... If the T's were not crossed, the I's were not dotted, it was not notarized, it was not legal yet. It was still going through the process, and they had the option to cancel. Boom. NXT comes up on the market. They bid. They bid hard. 70% higher than what NXT is making right now. It's a huge deal for NXT. Huge deal for the CW. Not a great deal for the NWA and Billy Corgan. Uh, but that's just my thoughts and my opinions. What do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments below. Do you think the CW? Uh, do you think the CW is right to choose NXT over NWA? Obviously. Do you think NWA blew it with the cocaine spot, or do you think it was just a matter of WWE is a bigger brand, bigger opportunity? It's a no-brainer. If you're looking for a wrestling company and WWE is one of those options, you spend a little bit extra than you were going to spend and you get WWE. But I do want to know your thoughts. Leave them in the comments below. Peace, love, and pizza. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. Is Vincent Kennedy McMahon finally getting his own? You're fired. As TKO is reportedly making moves behind the scenes to possibly give Vince McMahon the old boot in the ass. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. This as Vince McMahon has put up one third of his shares of his stock in the company of TKO bringing his ownership down from 16% to 11%, roughly. Now, some would say if he's selling all of his stock to get out of the company, why wouldn't he sell it all? Because that would tank the company. Vince McMahon just sold all of his shares. 16% of the company went on the market. That could be a bad sign. The price, uh, the stock already dropped just with the announcement of Vince's shares going up for sale. But why? Why is Vince's shares going up for sale? What exactly is going on? Uh, the first clip I want to play for you here is from Wrestling Observer Radio, where we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of the details of what's going on with the stock sale. And then we will check back in with you on the back end. And we got another clip coming up here after that. But first, check out this clip from the Wrestling Observer. More details on the sale of the stock. Doesn't have anything to do with inside the ring, really, but everything to do with the corporate side of things. Vince intends to sell off approximately one-third of his stock in TKO, the company composed of WWE and UFC. That is according to an official press release yesterday. McMahon plans to sell 8.4 million shares of TKO stock, which is currently valued, or at least was as of yesterday, at $713 million. McMahon would receive all proceeds from the sale with Endeavor Group, TKO's parent company, purchasing $100 million of McMahon stock. Endeavor CEO Ari Emanuel has also indicated his interest in buying $1 million worth of McMahon stock, while other unnamed company directors are also interested in purchasing $850,000 worth. The 8.4 million shares that McMahon would be selling off make up nearly one-third of the 28.84 million shares McMahon currently owns and would reduce his ownership stake in the company 
company from 16.4% to 11.6%. The stock closed on Thursday at $84.90. It fell in the after hours trading and opened this morning at $76.87. In a September regulatory filing with the FCC, TKO announced that all of McMahon's stock would be available for a buyback and he would not be tied to the same restrictions that other large company shareholders would be held to. At the time that occurred, Axios reported that McMahon, having the ability to sell his, st- to sell his stock, quote, seems to be give- about giving McMahon flexibility or maybe even TKO flexibility given the, given the ongoing investigation, end quote. As you may remember, there was a raid on uh, Vince and WWE again with still the FCC investigating and I guess the Southern District of New York still investigating or the SEC, I believe it said the FCC, but the SEC and the Southern District of New York looking into payoffs that McMahon had made and and in relation to all that stuff. Uh, The filing said that McMahon as well as well as two other TKO executives will be selling stockholders in this offering, meaning that they had planned to sell their stock at the time of the deal. This morning, David Faber on CNBC said that apparently, in quotes, it was about estate planning for McMahon, who is 78 years old. In this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave notes that McMahon has to maintain 7 million shares to keep his position as chairman of the board of directors, and even when the sale goes through at over 20 million shares, he is comfortably above that threshold. So is he just cashing out his stock because he's old? Because he's going to die soon? Probably, eventually. I mean, it is Vince McMahon, so it's not a guarantee. Uh, If anybody is going to live forever, it's going to be Vince McMahon, or at least live into his hundreds. I mean, his mom lived to be a hundred and something, so of course Vince would, that fucking bastard. But! Is this just a matter of Vince is old, so I'm going to cash out some of my shares here and live my life a little bit, right? Set up some shit for the great grandkids, the great grandkids, set up some other business ventures, set up all of my, tie up my loose ends. Uh, You know, one of the things was is that his stocks were kind of liquid, built right into the deal to begin with, and that is... Not always the case, and, and, you know, I'm no expert, so correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, uh, but it's not usually the case that somebody can have access to cash out their stocks right away like that uh, for the exact reason that it would, you know, they... It's a bad look for the company if it goes public immediately and then just all of a sudden people start selling off the stocks right away, so... Uh, You know, you want people to buy into that company. You want that to stay strong, though. There's rumors going around now that uh, that, this might just end up going private again, that TKO might be taken private. A lot of the people buying up Vince's shares are people already with the TKO group or Endeavor. So this is an interesting thing. So, uh, but... There's a lot of people who think Vince is just on his way out, that this is a maneuver from TKO to try to give Vince McMahon the old axe. And uh, for more information on that, let's hop on over to Sean Ross Sapp on Fightful on his show, The Hump, with Fightful owner Jimmy Van, who is somewhat of a business expert, as I understand it. And he kind of breaks down the business side of this and why he thinks due to different ways that the SEC is filing shit and that sort of thing that Vince is definitely on his way out. Check out this clip. Yeah, it it looks like they're looking to take steps to remove him as chairman. That's what it looks like. Uh, Now, I want to say one thing with the latest SEC filing because I saw some places report that there were two new sections in that and there was actually one new section in that one of them they'd filed in september but let me kind of break it down so the latest sec filing that endeavor filed uh for for q3 there was a couple of things related to vincent man in there one was about how um there is an adverse impact uh that future allegations and investigations could have on business performance that i think was the new one where they're basically saying you know this man being around that could impact 
uh, our, our business if there's another allegation. The other one had to do with his membership on the board and how it could have adverse financial uh, impact. That one they had put in the August filing. So that one wasn't new. They had said that before. One thing I want to say is I don't know about the provisions and the paperwork when they did the merger. I don't know if there's anything in there protecting Vince from a board vote before a specified period of time. And there's a thing called the AOA. It's the Articles of Association that a company like Endeavor would have that's got the rules and regulations in there with respect to internal, uh, internal affairs. I don't know anything that might be in there, but it sounds to me like they are planting the seeds for a board vote. That's what it looks yeah. like. And if uh, they do a vote and if Vince gets voted out, he does not have majority control to get back in this time. And people are confused on that because he had majority control of WWE, but he doesn't have majority control of the TKO. Endeavor does. So if he gets voted out as chairman, he's he's done. And it sounds like that's where they're headed. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to add, Sean? No, I mean, this. I think that you have said virtually everything that could be said about this well before it even happened. Like, well before it even happened. There's not really a lot more I can provide on that. But So with Vince McMahon's assets, his shares in the company of TKO being liquid as they are, as they were to begin with, I think this was a plan right from the beginning. Now, I also don't think that Vince McMahon is stupid enough to fall for this. In fact, he's Vince is a genius, even though he's old and senile and, and a bad booker and a rapist, possibly, maybe, allegedly. Uh, God damn it, allegedly. She liked it. Okay, I was in really bad taste. <laughs> But you have to admit that Vince McMahon is not stupid enough to just fall for some fucking, oh, TKO is going to swindle me out of the WWE. He's not going to fall for that. He's surrounded by brilliant people. If he didn't think of it, people around him were thinking of it. Jerry McDivitt, I think, you know, he just left WWE after being with him for a bajillion years. But even him, you know, Vince has lawyers, advisors. He's not going to fall for this shit. I think this is more a case of because all of this was going on during the fact that Vince was going through all this controversy and, you know, it could play out any which way. Who knows? He could go to jail, bad publicity, all of that. And he's fucking pushing 80 now, 75, 80. So he's going to not be around a whole lot longer. So. For him to have his 16% of the company be liquid, for him to be able to cash that out whenever he wants is both to his benefit as an old man, but also as a good escape mechanism for if any kind of shit hits the fan. He can just duck out. He doesn't have to stay tied or he could be bought out, which appears to be, you know, being the case for the most part. So... Uh, I don't think this was a sneaky swindle from Ari Emanuel and Endeavor, though I w you can't rule it out. It's just I don't think Vince McMahon's that dumb. He's just not. Vince would be the mastermind of this plot on his end. So they're, you know, buying fucking WCW, for example. He might swindle them. I, you know what I'm saying? In the, if the roles were reversed, I just don't think... V it doesn't make sense to me. You got to go with the, the path of least resistance if you want to find the most likely answer. It's got to be the answer that makes the most sense logically. This was structured this way to begin with because this was the plan to begin with. Vince was going to get phased out early on, but they had to keep him on both for the stock to go public for the people that were going to be like, oh, wait, WWE without Vince, whatever will happen to the WWE. Ah. So they had to keep Vince on as a figurehead. <clears throat> Two, Vince probably knew that, and Vince is not ready to let this go either. So Vince took the deal that kept him on as... Uh, as, you know, a, a creative control, not a creative like Triple H, but somebody that's still high up in the company, you know, has some control over his own company. So 
that was the deal that kept him on board. And then it was just structured in a way where he could be slipped out, whichever which way that that happens. Either way, I think the answer is still the same. I think Vince McMahon's on his way out the door. Uh, I think we're going to see a slow transition. We don't want to scare the stockholders or anything. Vince McMahon is going to see his way out maybe over the next couple of years. Because also, you know, another reason to keep Vince on board is the renewal of the WWE TV deals. Talking about people maybe not wanting to be scared of a WWE without a Vince McMahon, what will happen? Uh, you know, a lot of TV networks might feel that way. So it's a good idea to keep Vince McMahon on till all the business is squared away, right? We got a five-year TV deal with the CW. Uh, I don't remember what SmackDown signed for with uh, USA. It's either three or five, I'm assuming. <clears throat> And then SmackDown, I you know, will get its own three or five year deal. So once they're set up with all that, they can kind of shake things up any which way they want. And though, you know, they might take an initial bump on the stocks, it's not going to hurt them altogether. Um, <clears throat> with this sale of this stock, this would put Vince McMahon at 11 percent ownership. I would suspect that he'll keep ownership to a certain extent of this company when he leaves. He'll cash out the other third, maybe, and keep a third in TKO, or maybe not even that much. But uh, <clears throat> I think we're looking at a world where Vince McMahon is out of the way, and maybe he stays on board as a consultant. Maybe he, you know, what does Vince? What does a Vince McMahon do with his life other than eat fucking steaks and work out? And bang a bunch of young blondes and, and brunettes and who knows? Maybe he finally gets that divorce with the old lady. Maybe he goes and he joins AEW and he does a run in and he's brought out to face Ric Flair in his last match. Who knows? Who knows where everything's going to the, these days? Um, but certainly this is uh, a big shake up in the industry. And it's something that we're going to absolutely want to still keep an eye on and see where things go from here. But I think Vince McMahon on his way out the door. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Do you think Vince is on his way out? Do you think he's being pushed out? Do you think he was swindled, horn swoggled, bamboozled? Or do you think this was part of the plan all along? to just slowly phase him out after the TV deals. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Hit that subscribe button while you're there. Peace, love, and pizza. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. AEW, we have a problem. That was the title of a video I did about a year ago or so. And I kind of caught some flack about it because, ah, things aren't that bad and you're over-exaggerating, blah, blah, blah. Well, now taking a look around and uh, things are getting really bad. I mean, look at that that meme right over there. That side, I it's hard to tell with the mirror. Uh, Edge, Adam Copeland, standing there in the middle of the ring cutting his promo on live TV. With a completely empty crowd behind him. What's a guy like Edge think when he leaves a company like the WWE and he goes down to an AEW and that's what he sees, an empty crowd? It's getting bad. The problem with the attendance, the problem with the ratings, it's a problem with the booking. And this was the topic of conversation on the Jim Cornette experience this week. Jim Cornette and the great Brian Last breaking it down, talking about the slow ticket sales and the problems AEW's having in the ticket sale department. Check out this clip. And so you have some information on upcoming ticket sales to the events, do you not? Well, you know, we talk a lot about this stuff and a lot of people send us stuff. I decided to sign up for WrestleTix on Patreon, support them because they're doing this kind of stuff. And you sign up today, you get 6,000 emails tomorrow. <laughs> We've received a lot of emails. Let me see this one because a lot of these say first count. And I guess that means when they first started selling. But for instance, uh, November 22nd, Dynamite is coming to 
the Wintrust Arena, Chicago, Illinois. The available amount of tickets right now are 3,107. The current setup is 5,224. And the amount of tickets still distributed, or no, the amount of tickets overall distributed right now, excuse me, 2,117. The last time they were in Chicago, June 21st, 6,291. But the last time they were in that arena, they did better, and then they shit the bed when they fired the fucking hometown hero the week before the the last pay-per-view there, and now they've sold 2,000 tickets two weeks out for a national television program. And that's not all. It's not just the ticket sales. It's in the ratings as well, as we have in this clip here from Dutch Mantel's podcast, Storytime, with Dutch Mantel, him and James, talking about the low ratings this week and the Wrestling Observer trying to make excuses for it. This is, of course, the same day as the collision, the same day as Crown Jewel. Uh, check out this clip. AEW collision numbers were 366,000 this past Saturday, 0.09 in 18 to 49, the second lowest viewership ever uh, average this past Saturday. College that's, football. That's good. Well, I'm going to give you the quote for Brian. Uh, quite soon. College football competition was far lower than usual, but WWE Crown Jewel was on earlier in the day, but not head-to-head. It should also be worth noting that Rampage did 298,000, which also may have been the second worst viewer average in Wait his minute, regular Rampage time did what? 298,000. Wow. Seriously, they get more with old movies. Hell, that, that's, I swear to God, impact, that makes impact look good. Yeah. So... Brian Alvarez went on Wrestling Observer Live this past Tuesday trying to spin the second worst collision rating ever with no significant direct competition into a positive. I guess this would be considered good news, okay? The collision quarters were virtually an exact straight line. There were no ups and downs. Like the biggest up and down was like maybe 40,000 viewers at the very beginning. And other than that, it just went straight across. I mean, it's easy to go straight across when no one's watching in the first place. Yeah, and who who knows what you could just have it on to record. <laughs> You're not even watching it. You may not even watch it, but I don't think that's good. And we predicted this several months ago when we said that they're going to be running into those WWE pay-per-views and college football. But I don't know how you can spin that into a positive anyway. Because when the advertisers look at it, they don't look at what's it's against or anything. They look at that bulk number and they go by there. That's what they're paying it for. Yeah, and the advertising, as we found out with SmackDown very recently, advertisers don't pay as much for wrestling as they do for certainly other sports or mm-hmm. regular TV anyway. So mm-hmm. wrestling has to do fantastic that's always, in the race. That's always, that's always been that way. Look, man, things are getting really bad for AEW. This is stuff that you can't make excuses for any longer. Why are people not going to the live events? I can tell you from my own personal experience, I skipped AEW the last time they were in my own town. And, of course, I also chose to skip an AEW event and go to SummerSlam instead, uh, which, in hindsight, SummerSlam was kind of lame as well. But, uh, look, I've been to AEW shows before, and, you know, I've talked about it on this show. I've been to two shows. I went to the Blood and Guts. That was in Detroit. And I went to the uh, where Sammy Guevara went off the top of the cage and, and uh, Cesaro did the big swing to Jericho on top. And I was at the uh, the first dance where CM Punk made his uh, debut for AEW at the United Center in Chicago. Both of those were huge events and they were packed to the brim. They were full crowds. Other than like whatever, which would be left open behind the TV, uh, you know, the the cameras and the production and all of that. 
And other than that, they were jam-packed and the fans were enthusiastic. So what happened? Well, let's take a look at it. Because, uh, you know, in, in the ratings, even around then, we're struggling to stay over a million, uh, to, to hit a million. You know, the show started off kind of hovering around a million, million one, million two, nine hundred thousand. Now it's been, you know, in seven hundred, eight hundred thousand. Even into the sixes, if it's on a different night, it's not good. That's dynamite. That's their top show. Rampage in the 200,000s. 200,000s. Nobody's watching the show. That's, that's, that's like an error of margin of error amount of people. It's bad. It's bad. And look, I love AEW, or I did. Or, so that's the thing. As a fan, so I've skipped the last couple of shows that have come to my area and uh, the reason I have is because why would I, what's, I, there was nothing there I wanted to see. AEW has a good roster of talent, but I think once you've seen all the talent live, why do I want to go to see them live again? Unless there's good sh- stories going on, good shit happening. You know, that first dance was all about CM Punk. The rest of the show was kind of crap. There wasn't a lot of other good stuff even around it. That was a one-man show. Everybody was there for one reason. But it was worth it. Totally worth it. Uh, For that uh, uh, Blood and Guts match, that Blood and Guts show in Detroit, that was a bomb-ass show. Even Rampage had the Rampage Rumble where Dar- Brody King did the choke elimination of Darby Allen. Even in the crowd, we all gasped at that. That was just, man, there was some cool shit going on back then. <clears throat> so what happened? Why not go back? Well, I mean, look, their top stars are out injured or fired. CM Punk, fired. Uh, whether Wherever you weigh in on CM Punk or not, clearly... Since he left, it has been a hit to the ratings and attendance. Why hasn't Adam Copeland made a difference in that? That surprised me. I was actually... uh, I actually thought that Edge would make a difference. I thought between him and like a Mercedes Monet, they would be the difference makers that would kind of replace a CM Punk. But that hasn't seemed to be the case. It seems like... Seems like shit's still going down, and even, in fact, bringing in Adam Copeland has kind of given AEW TNA vibes. People are starting to say that. And that's where we know we're... That's that's concern. So, like, I personally skip the shows because there's no... You know, Brian Danielson's out hurt, Punk's fired or gone... Adam Cole Bay Bay is out hurt, but like even Adam Cole, I don't care about anyway because he hasn't bothered to hit the gym since he got signed to AEW. Not even by, I'm not a body shamer, but you are a professional wrestler. Key word in that phrasing, professional. I would think if it's your job to be a tough guy on TV in your underwear, you should probably do like some sit-ups and, and push-ups and go fucking pound some weights. But I digress, you know. I'm a body shamer. Just let any old skinny fucker on TV. Uh, anyway. Uh, so, and then what? You know, like Keith Lee has, is he's a joke. With his recent match with Samoa Joe, he's all grayed out, like fucking... Phil Banks from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Samoa Joe, uh, you know, as as cool as he is and as over as he should be, he's not. MJF hasn't moved the needle as champion. I think it's time to reevaluate that situation. Uh, that Their top story was the Adam Cole MJF storyline. And then Adam Cole got hurt. People were starting to dig that, and now it's like, eh. And now it's been dragged out and kind of lame. 
and everything that people liked about it's kind of getting boring and stupid now, right? And who's behind the mask? It's probably Adam Cole, which would be, I mean, that's the logical, that's what they should do. And that would be a dope, I think, you know, they could do something dope with that if it was him behind the mask. But, like, why? I don't know. Is that enough to draw you out to, to, are you... I, I I can't tell you the last time I've wa- I've started to keep tabs on AEW and not this is what I did with WWE when Vince when it got unbearable you know there was a stretch there in the mid two thousands uh, right up until a couple years ago where Triple H started to get more creative control uh, WWE is just unbearable and that's really where AEW was able to see a rise. And I think that's the second problem here is that AEW was able to be a, an alternative brand. They were a, a competitor brand, as Tony likes to talk, call himself, you know, the Pepsi to their Coke. Uh, but once people wanted that because they hated Vince, they resented Vince and his style of booking and everything was shit. And it gave rise to an alternative, which was great. But once Triple H took over, people started favoring Papa H again. And, you know, look, rightfully so. The booking's been, you know, WWE is not great still. I wouldn't say it's firing. I mean, business-wise, it's firing on all cylinders. But creatively, it's, eh, you know, some stuff's good. Some stuff's not good still. Is what it is. But they're this. <laughs> They're kind of squishing AEW like a bug right now. And AEW leaning towards older, former WWE talent more to try to pull the ship up is now giving the vibes of TNA. I think Edge was about as far as they could push it. And then when they came out with the big show on TV, wah, 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 wah. <clears throat> That's a bad move. <clears throat> you don't push old ex WWE talent to that extent, to that extreme. You keep Edge on collision. Okay? Have him slide into whatever you were doing with Punk. Just put Edge in there. Edge and Christian can play over on collision. Keep Dynamite more fresh. Keep Edge off of Dynamite. That way he's at least not oversaturating the company, not playing himself out, and not taking the spotlight from everybody else. MJF isn't working. You need to pull the trigger on that angle soon, which hopefully they will, the reveal of this masked guy, which will be Adam Cole, hopefully, and him maybe reuniting with uh, the Undisputed Era. And then they could fucking run rough shot over uh, AEW for a while as AEW champion if Adam Cole is able to heal. And, you know, fuck, bring in Bobby Fish again. Who cares? You know, Punk's gone now. They had that little tiff. Um, why not? You know what I mean? Um, that's a direction you could go because I don't think MJF is working right now. At least, like, he is doing great work, but. Obviously, he's not he's not doing business for AEW. If your champion is if you're the champion of a company that's losing in ratings and ticket sales, some of that's on you. Some of that's on you. So they need to make a move there. But who do you even put it on? Brian Danielson keeps hurting himself in every match that he has. Tony Khan's not, he's got ADD booking. He's stretching himself too thin. He's making an ass of himself online. That's the other thing. People are now, Tony Khan needs to get out of the spotlight for a while. If you're going to rehab AEW, you need to put somebody else, you need to get a booking team, a booking committee. I've said this for a long time. People shit on booking committees. Oh, booking committee. Blah, blah, blah. You can have one decider, one final say. He can sit at the meetings and say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. He doesn't need to sit and worry himself about what he's going to do creatively. Leave that to other people so he can worry about other shit. Growing the fucking business. Because they're not. Marketing in local areas. I'll say this for going to the live shows in my area. When Raw's coming to town, you hear about it. 
I don't even pay attention to shit. I don't watch local news or fucking go to the local arena every other month or anything. Like, I'm barely even leaving my house other to go to work and back. But I heard about it. I thought it was coming. You know, they do a YouTube ad, I think. And then they also got the billboards on the highways, like the electronic billboards. They put it right there. I don't see that shit for AEW. Why not? What are they doing for their local marketing? Are they sending anybody? Why isn't, like, you know, like, why don't they send, like, Danhausen to be at a comic book store in the area or some shit like that? Why aren't they doing that? They just let go of the fucking bunny? I love the bunny. She could actually work. She's not great, but she didn't suck. Why would, and, you know, uh, rumors are she may, it might be a personal thing. Whatever. Send the bunny out uh, to do, like, local... The Butcher, the Blade, the Bunny, and Danhausen. Send them to fucking... You know what I mean? Like, why not? What What is your problem? Why are you not sending... Why are you not doing more local marketing? They could do better ticket sales there. Their ticket prices are too expensive. They're thinking that they can make up for the lack of ticket sales in ticket prices by the diehards. That's going to make people that are going, eh, should I, should I not... You know, if I was on the fence about going to an AEW show and on a whim, if I was like, yeah, you know what, maybe I will. You know, I'm bored. Let's see what, you know, maybe I will go to him tonight. Go to Pop On. Well, fuck, tickets are, you know, cheapest tickets can be, what, 40 bucks. Processing fees after parking. You get down there, you fucking, you're looking at a $50 a night just to get in the door in, in a cheap seat. You buy the $12 bottle of water while you're there. You know, like all of that's got to be taken into consideration. And then it doesn't help when they're offering the buy one, get ones or whatever, because that just makes you look lame. You know, you do shit to stir up. You do the radio giveaways. You send fucking somebody to go be on the radio and give away tickets while you're there. Do fun stuff, you know what I mean? Say that you, you know, you placed tickets around the arena. So go on down to the arena to the, today and find, you know, an envelope taped to the building and you get a free ticket. Shit like that. Instead of just buy one, get one. Eh, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's a lack of cohesive store. Like some guys will be on the show and then they're just gone. For a while, or you'll want to be behind somebody, and then they'll just randomly be the tag team champion with Big Bill. Why? Why you're building Ricky Starks to be like a solo guy with you know with CM Punk, and then just nothing, just 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 drops right down to a tag team guy. Why? But Edge, Adam Copeland, walks right in, and he's at the top of the card every night, you know? There's just things like that, I think. And, and it, I think Tony Khan's personality, I know this is going long, but this is kind of an important rant here, so fuck off. Plus, it's my YouTube channel. You know what I mean? I can rant if I want to rant. I can rant if I want to rant. See, I just make shit up on the fly. Um been a long day fuck you uh i just think that they're you know the booking could do they, they need more cohesive booking they need to use less washed up talent they need to invest more in their main stars they need to have better stories they need to uh maybe do a better job split that roster you got such a huge roster why are there people that are not on one show or the other every single week get Tony Khan off of the internet for a while because people are starting to associate AEW with Tony Khan. So he's the face of the company, right? So like if people hate Tony Khan and think he's a weird, annoying fucking coked out Mark. They're going to not want to support AEW. Um, it's just bad move after bad move after bad move. And it's, Getting to the point where it's scary because I don't want to see them go the way of TNA. Like, they're doing these big arenas, but they're not filling them anymore. 
And it's to the point where people are saying, hey, why don't you try to do some smaller venues like the fairgrounds and shit? <laughs> it's bad. They're at a point where they could drop down to a TNA level. And once you're there, good luck climbing back up out of, you know, to be in the a WCW level again. And the, or they're also like giving out end of WCW vibes. They got to turn that ship around and they got to turn it around quick. Uh, those are just some of my thoughts on things they could do. But this one has gone long. But we can continue the discussion in the comments down below. If you have thoughts on some other things that AEW is doing wrong or could do different to make the shift and kind of uh, pull this ship around because they're fucking sinking. Hit that subscribe button while you're down there hitting those comments. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. The Screen Actors Guild strike is now over for all intents and purposes. So all the actors are on their way back to work, including John Cena, which means we probably will not be seeing much more of him around in the WWE anytime soon, which is probably why he lost that big squash match to Solo Sokoa over in Saudi Arabia for Crown Jewel. But one movie that John Cena has already filmed that will not be seeing the light of day was a movie that he filmed for Warner Brothers Discovery, a uh, James Gunn produced film, which was going to be a animated co uh, like a live action slash animated like Space Jam with John Cena and the Wiley Coyote as the Wiley Coyote versus Acme was the movie that's apparently done filming. John Cena's parts have been shot, but this movie will never see the light of day, most likely. For more information on why this is, we're going to jump on over to this clip from the John Campia show. John Cena's got this Wiley e. Coyote versus Acme movie coming out, a, a movie about that's supposed to be a CG live action hybrid. You know, kind of a little bit in the in the vein of uh, Space Jam, I suppose. You know, Warner Brothers has developed a little bit of a habit, if you will, of taking films that are already finished and throwing them away like they did with Batgirl. But it looks like maybe it's happened again as reports are coming out that Warner Brothers has made the decision that they're not going to release this Wiley Coyote versus Acme movie. Um, let's go over to the Hollywood Reporter and, and, and take in what they're saying here because there's a whole bunch here to unpack. Warner's no longer plans to release Coyote versus Acme, a live action CG animation hybrid that completed principal photography last year in New Mexico. The move follows veteran animation executive Bill, I'm not going to pronounce his name right, Damashki, uh, taking over Warner Animation Group earlier this year. So a new boss comes in, decides, no, we're not going to do this, this project. Uh, then, you know, the, the, uh, the director of the film talked about how passionate he was about the film, and he's sad that it's gone. Anyway, the feature, which sources believe cost around $72 million to make, had key Warner talent involved in front of the camera and behind the camera. It stars John Cena, who starred in Max's popular DC show Peacemaker and is due to return for a second season. And DC Studios co-head James Gunn produced this movie and worked on the story. Now, there are a couple of things to mention here about the Cena situation, okay? The first thing is that while principal photography may have been done, that doesn't mean the movie was done. Because remember, this, this movie was going to be a CG live action hybrid. So just because they finished principal photography, that means they finished all the live action shooting. Like all that stuff was done. But it sounds like they still had a lot of the heavy lifting to do, putting in the CG elements, the characters, all that kind of stuff. Not to mention... You know, if you're going to put it out theatrically, and this movie was made with the intention of going straight to streaming, 
and we all know that Warner Brothers is getting out of the business of making movies that are just meant to go straight to streaming. So this was originally go straight to streaming. So they only want to do theatrical now. To do this thing theatrically, they probably are going to have to pour more money into the CGI. A lot of the CGI they hadn't even done yet. Then you're going to have to mount probably a $50 million marketing campaign uh, to get it out. And $50 million is modest. A $50 million marketing campaign for a film of that size is modest. So you're probably looking at spending another $25 to $30 million on the CGI. Probably another $40, $45, $50 million on the marketing. And the new boss who took over Warner Animation, I guess, just stepped in and said, this doesn't fit with the way we're going and the direction that we're heading. And it's going to be better for us financially just to shelve the project. Yeah, Warner Brothers got a new guy in the animation department and just said, you know what? This is probably going to lose us a shit ton of money. We could probably better put our resources somewhere else. So they just shelled an entire like $75 million movie. Just put it right up on the shelf, write it off, take a loss. So somewhere out there, there is an entire film. Now, this was not edited necessarily or the animation was not done. That's probably why it was shelved, as John Campia said there. Uh, just to save on the extra cost, you know, the extra cost to animate and, and produce that and then to go out and market it. It was probably not going to make that money back after the 75 that was already spent to produce what John Cena was able to film for it, along with the other whatever live action actors that were going to be a part of it. Uh, so no knock on John Cena. So if you hear this reported anywhere else in the wrestling News circle that John Campia show clip. Uh, John Campia is a Hollywood insider. So he is in the trades, the Hollywood trades media, uh, which is essentially the dirt sheets for movies. He is not in the dirt sheets for pro wrestling. So if you hear any of the dirt sheets start to report any kind of, oh, John Cena's movie canned. Uh, and try to spin it like his career is in danger or that it was anyway his fault. Uh, it's all a bunch of bullshit. Don't believe it. You heard it here first. Uh, well, you heard it in the John Campia show first if you heard that. But uh, John Cena's movie canned, shelved, not going to happen. I was kind of, you know, look, man, I think that's a dope idea. Apparently it was like... Uh, Wiley Coyote is suing the Acme company because of all the products that have gone wrong for him over the years, which is funny. I like that. And if they're going to do it in the, the vein of a space jam where there's animated and then there's, uh, you know, live action along with it. What's the other one? I know there was another one that's on the tip of my tongue and you're like, there's another one besides space jam, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, you know, when you're on camera and you're recording shit, not everything is just right there on the tip of your tongue, you know. So, fuck you guys, but I do know that there are other live action. And no, not Space Jam 2. That's not what I'm thinking about, Space Jam 2. Um, but it would have been fun to see that kind of thing. But John Cena is going to be just fine. His Hollywood career is going to be just fine. Everything is good in the hood. Uh, Peacemaker is still going strong, and you know he's put he put Peacemaker on the map, quite frankly. And I don't see John Cena's career going down the shitter anytime soon, especially because James Gunn is the head of DC Studios, and James Gunn has a very particular liking for wrestlers, working with wrestlers, working with Batista and the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and he really likes John Cena. He created that Peacemaker show for John Cena, and he's the studio head. Um, of course, the Wile E. Coyote movie was not a DC property, so uh, just because James Gunn was a producer on that project does not make him the final say in that. And He was, uh, you know, the Warner Brothers animation guy, nixed it. It is what it is. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next, but I want you guys to leave down in the comments your thoughts would you have liked to see this movie? What was the other live action slash anime? Who framed Roger Rabbit? Was that it? That was certainly one. Was that the one I was thinking of? Or is there still yet another? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. And uh, like I said, if you see it anywhere else and they try to put a spin on it, tell those motherfuckers, can't see me. 
NXT's very own Lexus King, formerly known as Brian Pillman Jr., made an appearance on the Hall of Fame podcast with Booker T this week and had a conversation that I thought was a, this was a hell of an interview uh, with Pillman Jr. Very insightful, very raw, very open. Uh, and he just kind of sat down with Booker T and opened up about his life being raised by an abusive stepfather after losing his real father and never really knowing his real father. Uh, it was super insightful. And uh, they talked a little bit about coming to NXT. They didn't talk a lot about AEW or really anything about AEW. Um, so there's nothing there to dig into, but, uh, they did talk about how, uh, you know, Pillman came to WWE and he wanted to change things up and that was kind of, they gave him the freedom to do that. So that a lot of this Lexus King shit comes from him. Uh, but it was in this particular clip here where he talks about living in that shadow of his father, flying Brian, the loose cannon, Brian Pillman. And what it was like kind of growing up with that and how that had an impact on his life and driving him into becoming a professional wrestler and filling those boots that are uh, by some that some would say would be completely unfillable. Check out this clip. Do you feel like you was born to do this? You know, I, I think about that a lot and, you know, it's almost like I feel like I never had a choice. You know, I felt like it was always in my blood, you know, for the fact that the day he decided he was going to name me Brian Pillman, I was I was trapped. You know, it was everywhere I'd go, you know, go to the grocery. Oh, Brian Pillman. You know, it, it's it's just a it's a household name in Cincinnati where I grew up. And uh, so I couldn't escape that legacy. I couldn't escape all the reminders of him. And, and to be fair, you know, he didn't exactly leave me a choice. You know, he, he left me on this earth without anything. You know, I didn't grow up with, with all the, all the wealth and all the accolades that, that, that he, you know, that gained throughout his life. So I had to, I had to scratch and claw and, and find my way through it. I couldn't just go to school and just, you know, I did go to school and I did do all those things, but I needed more. I needed, he, he, he made it. So I needed to reclaim all that. You know what I mean? I've, I've never been content with just being average because I know what, what the Pillman name used to have. And, and instead of building on this wealth of his, you know, I, I didn't inherit any of that. I didn't inherit anything. So now I have to go back out there and reclaim it all. So, and, and the best way to do that, with my genetics and, and my personality and what I inherited from him indirectly is to be a pro wrestler. You know what I mean? I, I, I was never going to succeed at anything else. You know, there was just that, that bone in my body that, you know, just the, the hoop person I am only works in this world. You know, I, I'm almost, I, I'm almost more blessed in that sense that now I have something to chase. You know, I have, this 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 drive to to be better than he was you know and and you know had he been around maybe i wouldn't have had that maybe i would have resented the business because i didn't need it i don't know it's hard to say you know every every second generation wrestler goes through their own uh trials and and, and tribulations with this business and how it affects them again i thought this was a fantastic interview with pillman jr I thought we learned a whole lot about him. I think he gave us something to latch on to, something to get behind, something to support. This was something that uh, Jim Cornette was ranting and raving about for a long time on his show, about how after the Dark Side of the Ring episode with Brian Pillman Jr. kind of blew him up a little bit, that AEW didn't capitalize on him at all. And set him up as a sympathetic baby face, you know, trying to, you know, after living through all of that, kind of play off of that and build off of that, try to get him somewhere. 
And WWE has done just that with the vignettes that they did that were acknowledging his father and his history. But why he switched to the name Lexus King, which is growing on me a little bit. I hated it at first. And it just Lexus sounds weird. We already have a zillion kings in the world of professional wrestling. But, you know, as is everything, Dolph Ziggler, right? Big Show. Remember when Big Show, some of you guys old enough to remember when when the Giant came over and he was the Big Show? Even just calling him Paul White was weird. And just by the time we got barely used to calling him Paul White, uh, which was spelt weird, too, on top of it, then we had to start calling him the Big Show. We were like, Big Show. You know, so every once in a while, these names will catch you off guard, but they grow on you, and over time, it just is what it is. So, Lexus King, fine, whatever. Uh, especially, you know, when they're acknowledging, at least they're acknowledging his history and why he's making the change. Uh, and with this interview and some of the things that he's done, the vignettes and, and that sort of thing, I think... There's something there. Now, I've been on record as saying, I've said this a couple times, and I still kind of stand by it, but I'm hoping I get proven wrong. I've said that I think they're going to find out what AEW found out was that there's nothing really there with Brian Pillman Jr. Now, uh, I'm already starting to be proven along to a certain extent because the packaging of Brian Pillman Jr. in NXT as Lexus King has been leaps and bounds better than it ever was in AEW as the the what the Hollywood the varsity blondes with Griff Garrison and just you know and then the MJF angle real quick and you know like they never did shit with Brian Pillman to the extent at least they're doing shit with Brian Pillman in NXT so uh there's something there so I hope I'm wrong. The packaging, the presentation, it's there. But I also see little hints of stuff in his, you know, obviously his work and his his promos and that sort of thing that still isn't quite all there. And, you know, I, I famously said on one of these shows that I think he's much more of a Curtis Axel than he is a Randy Orton as far as a second generation. Of course, Orton's a third generation, but you get the point. Uh, I think, or Charlotte Flair, pick your second generation that has excelled. Dom Dom. I don't know if we're there yet with Dom Dom. Um, I, he, he strikes me as more of a Curtis Axel talent, but he's down there in NXT. He's got the best possible training and development that could possibly be provided to him at this point uh if he fails he will fail because he just doesn't have it because now in the nxt system he's being on coming up under sean michaels being developed under the heartbreak kid himself who knows a thing about a thing or two about turning bad and, and like just fucking building your your presence, you know what I mean? Uh, the in-ring they can work on and just ugh, the promos, the coaches. He has every opportunity in the world and they've shown me enough where I hope to God I'm wrong and I hope we see one of the next big stars out of Brian Pillman Jr. because I like the kid overall. I liked him in AEW. I liked the Varsity Blondes. I liked him with the mullet. I thought he made the mullet work. I thought there was something there, but over time, it just kind of seemed, okay, this guy has not impressed me any further. Got to be the point where he was there two years, three years, and I wasn't seeing anything new from him. And maybe that was because AEW just wasn't using him, but, you know, it also kind of struck me that he hadn't improved in the ring. His promos hadn't gotten any better. Maybe that's the coaching. Maybe that's the development. So I hope I'm wrong. Hopefully he's not the next Curtis Axel, who was a hell of a talent. He trained The Rock in the ring. Like, physically he was good, but, like, you know, not a star. Will Alexis King be a star? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Do you like the name? Do you think he'll be a breakout star? Or do you think he's the next Curtis Axel, just a second generation that gets lost in the mix? Well, they tried, but he just doesn't have it. 
or does he have it? And it will be refined and polished and developed into a fine, shiny diamond that will be at many WrestleManias to come. Let me know in the comments below. Hit that subscribe button while you're there. Thumbs it up. It's I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. Woo! The Nature Boy Ric Flair has signed a two-year deal with All Elite Wrestling, and this has pissed a lot of people off. Wouldn't you know it? People on the internet are pissed. Weird. Weird how that happens. Our good old friend Ric Flair, 976 years old, still making his way down to the ring, still wheeling and dealing, jet flying, limousine riding, all of that stuff. Ridened out the last few days of the Stinger till Stinger's retirement match. But this is not without controversy. In fact, some people are referring to Tony Khan as possibly being hypocritical. As he has been very outspoken as of late about Vince McMahon and all of his scandals. When just a couple years ago, there was a big scandal for Ric Flair, which had, didn't exactly get cleared up. It just kind of went away and got forgotten about. Also, Ric Flair is another old, washed-up WWE guy, wrestling legend, being brought in to help tna AEW. For more on this hypocrisy and the inner workings of the Ric Flair to AEW situation, let's check in with our boy James as he's hanging out with Dutch Mantel on Storytime with Dutch Mantel. That's Ric Flair signs with AEW. So I've got loads, well, I've got loads of information on it, but you uh, tell me your initial reaction to Ric Flair getting signed to a two-year deal. Well, I'm thinking <clears throat> he was supposed to be there two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Then that unfortunate episode of Dark Side of the Ring aired, which showed Flair, uh, which showed the true Flair, really. And then Tony Khan apparently saw it and said, oh, no, I, 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 I can't. I can't bring him on if that's if that's what happened. Now, after all this, he still nothing has changed except now he has signed Ric Flair, and he's coming this time with a, a sponsorship. I guess I don't know to pay his way. I don't know, but it kind of makes Tony Khan out to be a hypocrite if he's going to you know, on moral reasons, moral grounds. He, he, he went back on his initial reluctance to bring Ric Flair in and all of a sudden brings him in because he needs, he needs help. His ratings are not that good. Look, you bring Edge in, you bring in fucking big shows returning to the ring. You got Ric Flair now walking down to the ring and you know Ric Flair's out there wanting to take his last fucking match. He said he's ready to do bumps. He said he is cleared to wrestle if he wanted to wrestle. Oh, but they won't let me. You know he's going to keep pushing for that. This is a problem. Ric Flair with AEW is a problem. He does not need to be there. Now, if you were going to bring him in for an appearance, a couple appearances per show deals to uh, do the angle with Sting, fine. It's Sting's last match. If you want to tell that story, if that was pitched by Sting, hey, it'd be cool to do something with Rick before I, you know, hang it up. Or, you know, this was just some sort of creative, brilliant idea. Fine. But then to sign Rick for two full years... Two full years? Now, for those unawares, this is uh, a similar to the Macho Man's Slim Jim deal with WCW, uh, in which the sponsorship is essentially paying for the wrestler to be there. Uh, in the case of the Macho Man Randy Savage, he brought the Slim Jim sponsorship with him, 
And that deal with WCW was enough to pay for the Macho Man to be there. And apparently Lanny Poffel on top of that, too. Uh, you know, with some to spare. So it was a good deal at the time. Now, Ric Flair's energy drink, woo, energy, is the official energy drink of the AEW. Woo. And uh, I don't know about all that. I think these kind of sponsorships are tacky. Um, by the way, this uh, this episode is sponsored by G Fuel. G Fuel is the official sponsor of the Seth Grimes Media. I'm just kidding. I wish I was sponsored by G Fuel. It used to be Bang. No Monster owns Bang. Bang's still good, but they're expensive. Uh, this is a sidebar. Uh, <laughs> Ric Flair going into AEW is just another thing that just makes AEW as a company look bad. It's another thing to make fans cringe. Now, there are Ric Flair fans out there. They're going to be those watching this video, and you're going to put in my comments, well, Ric Flair, AEW, AEW, and you. Shut up. I know. I get it. Ric Flair is a star, was a star. He's got his fan base. I get it. I'm not oblivious to that, but it's a bad for the perception of AEW at this point. For the things that they have been doing, the ex WWE stars are starting. They're starting to teeter into TNA territory, uh, both with the fan attendance and the the, <laughs> the ratings, and now with all the big stars that they're bringing in that used to work somewhere else and now are past their prime. All of this is a huge problem. Again, for the one-off stories and stuff, you know, the road to Sting's retirement as his, like, official manager. Maybe not, you know, it's not, I, I don't know if it's going to draw anybody in, but I don't know that it's doing any damage. But to sign Ric Flair for two years, we don't even know that Ric Flair is going to be alive for two years. Or what other kind of scandals are going to come up for Ric Flair? Is he going to want to try to wrestle? Are they going to let him wrestle? Is he going to take some weird bump? Is he going to get busted open? Somebody's going to bloody Ric Flair up. on. Mark my words. Circle this. Play it back. Somebody's going to bloody up Ric Flair because he's been cleared to take bumps and shit at least. So if he's the manager to Sting, somebody's going to try to get heat on Sting by bloodying up Ric Flair and Sting's going to have to come to his right. You know what's going to happen. And if Tony doesn't approve it, Rick will gig himself because who cares? It's Tony. He's a mark. Right? I think Rick's going to give a shit if Tony told him, no, Rick, don't bleed out there. Whoops, I, I, it was an accident. Uh-huh. What's that taped to your finger, Rick? Nothing. Woo! It's just a bad look. AEW is just going in the wrong direction every single which way that you look. Every single thing that they're trying to do, every single thing that they're doing different or, or trying to adjust or what they're bringing in, or, or it, they've lost their way. What are they even doing with themselves right now? It's too much. It's too much. It's too much, man. I would have thought, I would have hoped that Edge would make a difference for them, and he hasn't, apparently. Not at all. Not even a little bit. Ric Flair is not going to be a difference maker. I get that. It's not going to cost him money, but now you got to have Ric Flair on your TV for two years, and you got to have the Woo Energy drink being marketed everywhere. Of all the energy drinks in the world, the fucking Woo Energy drink, the mushroom one, you can drink mushrooms and shit. What the fuck are you... I don't know, man. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What did you think of the nature boy? Ric Flair being signed to a two-year deal with AEW. Is it a no-brainer because somebody else is essentially paying for it, and all you got to do is put a fucking can up on your announce desk and, and plug it once or twice a show or you know, for two years, and you got Ric Flair? Or is it a really bad move because you already got enough old guys and you don't need an old, pervy guy that's probably going to die on your roster. And not only that, the, hip the hypocrisy of Tony Khan. All the shots he took at Vince McMahon about being a creeper and all the, his allegations. When he knows goddamn well that Ric Flair has his own allegations in his past. And what seemingly, you know, Ric Flair was going to be brought in two years ago but was passed on because of those allegations. 
And now all of a sudden it appears it was just, oh, we'll just let the smoke clear. You know, the dust settle. Let's let things blow over. Let me know your thoughts down below. Hit subscribe. Thumbs up if you liked it. Peace, love, and pizza. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. Woo! So I thought we wrapped a bow on this whole CM Punk thing a couple weeks ago when Sean Ross Sapp had reported that WWE specifically told him there were zero negotiations and that fans should not, I repeat, should not be getting their hopes up about CM Punk appearing at Survivor Series in Chicago. Chicago. The other day, I had debunked a fake Twitter scoopster that said CM Punk is signed to a one year, $11 million contract. I said, this is completely false. I got a call from a WWE higher up unprompted, unprompted. And they said, CM Punk not only is not signed by AEW, we are not, are not signed by WWE. WWE. We are not in negotiations with CM Punk top talent and jimmy knows who this top talent are is it safe to say jimmy that wdb is not going to lie or risk alienating these top talents 100 percent, 100 percent. we're outright told he ain't coming in they're not planning on it it's not happening that's what these top talent were outright told another one is well of course they're trying to keep the surprise no specifically in that call i was told that they did not want to set unrealistic expectations for fans watching or going to the show now. But yet the fans took that as, oh, well, you know, the dirt sheets aren't, the WWE's not going to tell the dirt sheets. No, they're not going to tell them. But they also don't feed them false stories like that because they like to still be able to do business with the dirt sheets when they need to. But yet... When it comes to CM Punk, everybody's going to have speculation. The speculation will never end. And apparently somebody stirred something up on Twitter this week saying that talks have been back on between CM Punk or are now open between CM Punk and the WWE. And that WWE is uh, that the board board members are having meetings with CM Punk now. When's the last time the board members got a, got uh, took meetings with potential wrestling talents to hire them? Huh? Isn't that like a creative thing? You think uh, you think Triple H had to run like fucking Kyrie Sane by the board of directors before he brought her in, or do you think he could just bring her right in? Nonetheless, that's what some guy speculated on the internet. Here's a clip from JD from New York talking about this Twitter rumor and how Sean Ross Sapp bitch slapped it back out into space again. Check out this clip. CM Punk, man, despite WWE's previous denials of having talks with CM Punk, there's yet another rumor circulating about Punk's potential return to the company. The latest rumor is from WWE insider, (coughs) geek, (coughs) insider, Boozer Wrestling on Twitter, who claims Punk is scheduled for a meeting with WWE board members and that the general consensus within WWE is that he will return to the company. Boozer Wrestling says this, and I quote, Punk was recently scheduled for a call with few board members. Backstage feeling is it's happening. Doesn't mean it's done. I'm waiting for a follow-up on the call. It should be the last step before things go down. Now pace yourselves. Those few weeks will be ruckus. Lots of teases on TV and social. They will milk it like crazy. So enjoy it until I get a solid answer. End quote. Now, Sean Ross Sapp reported immediately after this report went down on social media that WWE sources continue to deny that there are talks with Punk and that fans should not expect to see him 
at Survivor Series. Essentially, WWE management does not want anyone to get too excited about the punk rumors. Things can always change in wrestling, but according to WWE sources, the rumors are false. Look, I'm going to say good luck on uh, your high hopes about CM Punk being at the Survivor Series in Chicago. Uh, but I know right up until the show, I people, people at the show are going to be chanting for CM Punk. Uh, so obviously this could be a thing. And look, things could happen last minute, too. Triple H could put in a last minute call. Media hype could be so big. We remember things like this happen. Like when uh, uh, The Undertaker was going to come back and they ran that promo for him, but everybody thought it was Sting. So WWE, because the fans were so like already made themselves believe that it was going to be Sting, the WWE reached out to try to bring Sting in to try to make it happen because the fans were demanding it. So. Uh, the more the fans persist on this CM Punk, the more they push the CM Punk issue, uh, the closer that they could actually become to WWE signing them. But I don't think that that's going to happen, at least not yet. Uh, but maybe TNA, right? Maybe TNA is the place that he could go. A lot of people saying that TNA is the place to be. There's an offer out there for Punk to go to TNA to not make anywhere near the money that he would make anywhere else, uh, but that he would probably have a lot more fun and a lot more creative freedom. There's even speculation that it is CM Punk under the mask in AEW. The masked man that's beating the devil mask, beating people up backstage, that that man is, in fact, none other than the man CM Punk himself. And the whole firing angle was a swerve, brother, brother. You've heard it all. You've heard it all speculated. For more on this, uh, the thoughts, the theories, and where this inevitably ends, does it end, where it leads, and how to play this if you're WWE or any other company, check out this clip from the Busted Open Radio Show. Listen, we're going to find out some things uh, over the next couple of weeks here when it comes to CM Punk. Uh, because even he's kind of trolling fans as well. He's doing commentating for uh, MMA, and they're dropping kind of WWE hints and TNA hints. Justin, so I feel like we're going to maybe not have a definitive answer, but at least understand things a little bit more once we get to Survivor Series in Chicago, don't you think? Uh, I don't know, because here's the thing. Even if we get through Survivor Series... And he doesn't show up there in Chicago. <laughs> Royal Rumble, that train's coming a few months later. So it, it, the, 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 the speculation is going to continue. Um, it's going to continue inevitably. All, all I can say is this, is that uh, obviously I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't, my opinion is I don't think he's coming back in Survivor Series. I don't think he is. But I will say this, is that if he's not, if he's, if he's definitely not, uh, I just WWE, hopefully they know better. Don't make any Survivor Series match where there is a mystery partner or there's anything because <laughs> uh, you are because you're just no no but 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 they're giving saying, it away. Well, no because oh, no, no, no 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 because you're setting oh, yourself up. You know. yeah. yeah, you're setting yourself up for everybody's gonna go. Oh my God, it's Punk! It's Punk! And then if it's not Punk, so just I'm, I'm saying if, if WWE does not have Punk, if they do not, make sure you don't have any Survivor Series match where you have any kind of like tune in to see who it is. <laughs> that ain't gonna go well. You're absolutely right, because if there's any little bit of a slight opening where people might think they he's going to make it an appearance, they're going to grab that, especially in Chicago. I think anything with CM Punk is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Not necessarily for bringing him in. I don't know if you'd be damned if you brought him in. But there's no, like... You're never, there's nothing you could ever possibly say or do that will ever convince any CM Punk super fan any differently. They're going to believe that he's going to come out uh, like uh, Justin Labar said there in that clip from Busted Open. Uh, Survivor Series will come and go and then people will go, well, what about the Royal Rumble? CM Punk's going to be number 30 in the Royal Rumble. And then they're going to get their hopes up about that. And then they're going to be disappointed when that last entry is some other guy and not him. You see where this goes. This is the constant. This is the ever 
just just it's inevitable. This is what happened for the last seven years before CM Punk was brought back to AEW. Fans were, oh, what about Punk? Anytime there was a mystery guy, anytime something was in Chicago, anytime there was a tweet that hinted at something, Punk's not doing anybody any favors. He's joking around on on Twitter all the time about it, you know, posting weird shit, you know, cryptic stuff that kind of hints in, in all the different directions. Um, where should Punk land, if anywhere? I think if TNA is going to really try to make a hard push at this, and I think especially with AEW's weakness, this might be a time to put a lot, a lot of, uh, to put your balls on the table for TNA and really go for it. You could take that number two spot from AEW. Uh, as, as wild as that is to believe, and though I don't know that that's necessarily true because they don't have as big of TV. Um, but certainly if they were to add CM Punk to them, they're uh, going to close that gap between number two and number three that they have right now as a company. You know, they're going to get right up in there. You know, if they could bring CM Punk into the fold along with their rebranding to TNA from Impact, that could be a game changer for TNA. That could really put them on the map, but it would cost them a lot of money. Punk would have to take a big loss and just the perception level. Uh, I think TNA might be in a position right now, in all honesty, where it wouldn't be the TNA LOL. I think they kind of have a little bit of goodwill behind them right now. I think this could actually, that move could actually work and might be the smart play, um, but it couldn't be a full time gig. And, uh, you know, per the perception, you know, for Punk going out there, oh, I wrestle for TNA, uh, the star, his star power is going to go down greatly. I think the place for him is AEW or WWE if he wants to stay. You know, he could go over to New Japan for a little bit even. Why not? Though there's, I've heard zero speculation on any of that. That could be a move that he makes. Though I don't think he'd leave his dog Larry and his precious wife April for that long to go just work in Japan. So, I don't know. I don't know if we ever see Punk in a ring again anywhere. Um, but I think, honestly, it's as equal as anywhere at this point. Equally, WWE, TNA, or back in AEW, he could end up in any of those places. But where is the best fit for CM Punk, for old Philly boy here? Um, well, first of all, the people that don't like Punk and say he's better off not in the business, they're wrong because there's money to be made there with Punk. And just because half of a wrestling audience or a portion of the wrestling audience doesn't like CM Punk doesn't mean that the rest of the wrestling audience isn't going to pay money to see and buy merch and all of that. So that's ludicrous. Back in AEW would certainly give them a boost in the arm if he was the masked man. <clears throat> I think that would be a game changer for them. I think that would definitely give them a big pick-me-up. It would get people talking. They could play it off as a swerve. Maybe it was a swerve the whole time. Maybe they're playing fucking chess with us while we're thinking checkers. Who knows? Uh, but I don't believe that to be the case either. I think Punk is gone with the company. And him going back to AEW would help AEW, but I don't know that it would be good for Phil. You know, <clears throat> he's going to run into the same issues. He's not going to, get you know, have respect for Tony Khan or AEW or any of the young wrestlers. He's going to have beefs with people in the locker room. He's going to be thick-headed. It's a hostile territory, you know, there's no, it's still, the dust hasn't settled there. Um, over in WWE could be a good move. Bring him in for limited appearances. Very limited appearances. Bring him in to, uh, bring him in for like a uh, three pay-per-view deal or something like that. <clears throat> Or a one-year deal with five matches or three three to five matches, Raw appearances or SmackDown appearances to build them up. Predetermined for the most part, so there's no arguing. You don't need to put him into any championship where he's stealing a spot from anybody. He's not 
you know, you could maybe tease him in a number one contenders, but then get screwed out of it by another guy, which sets up his next rivalry, stuff like that. Um, but you don't want to like, you know, you want to leave the main event spot for the guys that have been there and working for it. So you don't cause any locker room problems there. Um, they're just select dates. Come on in, have a little bit of a feud like Lesnar would do. Come, He'd pop in, have a little feud with somebody and he'd pop back out. Done. Gone. Boom, boom, boom. Do that with Punk. See how that goes. You know, bring them in from like a SummerSlam to a WrestleMania. Survivor Series to WrestleMania. Bring them in for Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, whatever the pay-per-view is between Rumble and, and Survivor Series. The one in Australia, that one, that would be a good one. Elimination Chambers in Australia, right? And then WrestleMania. And then go from there. After Mania, <clears throat> New deal, perhaps. Who knows? I think that could work if it was kind of predetermined. He wasn't getting in anybody's way. And he had, like, a provision, like, a clause in the contract. Like, it's very, like, Triple H. Was, like, you're not going to pull that AEW shit here. You start pushing around anybody or, you know, anybody starts complaining about you backstage. And you're a problem. We're just going to cut ties with you, and that's going to be that. We're not going to, you know... Punk had AEW by the balls a little bit because they needed to build their company around Punk. He was the top star. And not only that, but I think he secretly had like a EVP contract like the Bucks and Kenny Omega did. You know, uh, he had significant say and power and creative control over in AEW. He's not going to have that in the WWE. Um, so I think that might actually be, and he would maintain his star power. You know, he's a mega star, a household name. He's not lowering the bar to go back down and do indie shows and that kind of thing. With that said, the last big option is TNA. TNA is doing the whole rebranding thing from Impact back to TNA. We always called them TNA anyway, so might as well go with it. It's still a shitty name, but it was always their name, and they're always called TNA. So just it is, they're stuck with it. it is, they are the Dolph Ziggler of pro wrestling promotions. Dolph Ziggler based off of a porn star character, right? And Boogie Nights or some shit like that. So... If he's based off of the, you know, then TNA, tits and ass, ooh, well, they're told, well, it's stuck. So and here we are. Regardless, uh, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying whatever. <clears throat> they're beating a dead horse. They're fighting an upward battle to just try to stay as impact. <clears throat> but I think they have some, you know, goodwill with the fans right now. I think... Fans are willing to, you know, there's a nostalgia for the TNA, and I think fans are willing to accept TNA. And I think if they came out, especially with AEW on the decline right now, as they are, if, say, TNA were to able to come up with a top star like Punk and do the same thing I just talked about with WWE, bring him in for select dates and feuds, uh, but he would have to make significantly less and probably get back that creative control. And it would probably end up being the CM Punk show as it was in AEW. <clears throat> so there's all that to contend with. So I think inevitably, probably the best spot creatively, financially, all of that would be another run or two in the WWE. But uh, I think TNA could make the best use or has the most need for a CM Punk. If he's, willing to or able to or if they could work anything else out there um i also think AEW could really use him too i think he's a difference maker for both AEW or tna whichever would be uh willing to pick him up i just can't see if he was fired for real and it wasn't all a swerve i just can't see him going back to aew let me know your thoughts down in the comments below where do you want to see cm punk you want to see him in the WWE? You want to see him back at Survivor Series? You want to see him back in the Royal Rumble? You want to see him in TNA? Do you want to see him go away and never be heard from again? Let me know your comments in the comments. And uh, peace, love, and pizza. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. Like Mussolini. 
That's it, y'all. Another episode in the can. Episode 93 of the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. This is a tough one to get through. I mean, my throat's really dry and I'm like coffee. Not coffee like the drink, but I'm coughing. <laughs> so a little bit of a tough one to make it through. You know, you're, you're on a rant and you're trying to go and all of a sudden you feel a cough coming on and you're trying to hold it back. Is what it is. Such is the shift to the winter season. I want to thank you guys for hanging around. I know I missed the last couple weeks. Is what it is. Uh, I'm not going to uh, apologize too much for it. I spent the time. It was my birthday in there and uh, also Halloween, one of my favorite holidays. And I spent some time hanging out, doing Halloween stuff with the kids. Made a few Halloween-centric videos to kind of keep videos coming on to the YouTube channel. Uh, plus a little bit burnt out on the Pro Wrestling Podcast. And, you know, there was a lot of not super huge stories or not enough to fill a whole show with anyway. Um, <clears throat> which is a problem from time to time. Just filling a whole show with, you know, finding enough stories that are, you know, able to be talked about at length. So... This is part of the work I do for you as a podcast journalist. So I took a couple weeks off, did some Halloween videos. I encourage you to check those out if you haven't already. Top 10 pro wrestling horror characters and also my top 10 favorite horror movies for the month of October. Um, I also did a video I recorded me and the kids going through a corn maze. I haven't posted that yet, but I'll probably do that. I've been working on just a little side thing too. I want to give a try to some other little project that I'm working on. <coughs> See the cough. I'm not going to edit that one out because we're at the end and it's just us now. It's just us now. Nobody's, you know, this isn't a separate video or anything. So we can just get real with it here. Get real with it. But I love you guys. I appreciate you hanging out with me. Uh, just, you know. Bear with me. I got a life too. You know, kids, girlfriend, birthday, Halloween, burnout, job, side hustles, writing, writer. Uh, all of these things, you got to juggle them. Uh, I'm just trying to do the best I can out here in the world. And uh, we're going to keep on marching forward to episode 100. This was 93. And also 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. If you are not listening on YouTube, watching on YouTube, please join me over there. Throw me a subscribe ski. I know some people just are not YouTube people, and I I, I appreciate that. I do. Um, but that is where we are trying to grow the biggest. With that said, though, I won't keep you any longer. Uh, just check out some of my other content, too. I got other shit that's going to be popping up. So uh, just roll with me, man. Just we're, you know, we're doing this thing, thing, one video at a motherfucking time. And you guys, I appreciate you hanging out with me. Peace, love, and pizza. I am your boy, Seth Grimes. And this has been the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast.